three-game series between the Tigers and the Chicago White Sox. The newspapers here in Detroit today heralded British Open champion Justin Leonard. Well, the Detroit Tigers hope tomorrow's headlines will talk about their all-star pitcher, Justin Thompson. Hi, everybody. I'm Kenny Albert with former White Sox manager Jeff Torborg. And Jeff, uh, for the Tigers, they sent Justin Thompson to the All-Star game two weeks ago, but he has missed his two starts since then due to elbow problems. Well, I think they've been very protective with him. They're, they're worried about him a little bit because he's had history of arm problem in the past. This kid is a big, strong kid with a great curveball. 295 ERA right now leading this staff. He is really one of the star building blocks of the Tigers' future. And Justin Thompson uh, leading the Tigers along with Willie Blair. Eight victories apiece. And the White Sox tonight will send their ace to the hill as well in Wilson Alvarez. Wilson Alvarez, of course, pitched for me. And his first start for the White Sox, 1991, was a no-hitter. He is really starting to establish himself as the ace of this staff. Never has been the ace before, but has stepped it up. He's a real tough competitor with very good stuff. So a couple of left-handers, Justin Thompson and Wilson Alvarez, will try and keep some big bats off the base path. Frank Thomas and Tony Clark to name two. The White Sox and the Tigers when we return. Texas, Chicago winning a pair in Baltimore yesterday. The White Sox 10 runs on a season high 19 hits. The umpire and crew tonight, Derwood Merrill behind the plate. Dale Scott at first base, Dave Phillips at second, Rocky Robe down at third. The Chicago White Sox Batting order brought to you by Shell. Second baseman Ray Durham will lead it off, followed by center fielder Mike Cameron. Frank Thomas at first base. Thomas leading the American League at 373. He will be followed in the cleanup spot by left fielder Albert Bell, right fielder Lyle Bouton. The DH is Harold Baines. Chris Snowpeck down at third as the White Sox anxiously await the return of Robin Ventura. Ron Karkovice behind the plate, his first start in nearly a month. And Norberto Martin at shortstop batting ninth. And 24-year-old Justin Thompson, a big left-hander, 6'4", 215, with excellent stuff on the mound for the Tigers. An all-star, throws 91 to 93 miles an hour with a great curveball. And by the numbers, you can see this young man is off to a great start. After being 1-6 last year, 8-6 this year with an earned run average under 3, that's really doing something. Justin Thompson pitched a 1-2-3 inning in the All-Star game. He struck out Ray Langford. His battery mate tonight, Matt Walbeck, around the infield for the Tigers. As we take a look, Tony Clark, Damian Eastley, Davey Cruz, and Travis Fryman down to third base. Former Astro number one draft pick Phil Nevin in left field tonight. His fifth different position this season. Ryan Hunter, the Major League's stolen base leader in center, and Melvin Nieves in right field. Yeah, there's the guy they call the Big Hurt, or so named by Kenny Harrelson, one of the announcers for the White Sox. Taken away from years ago, Stan Williams, who was a big hurt for the Dodgers, but Stan was nowhere near as big as Big Frank Thomas leading the league in hitting six foot five, almost 270 some pounds. This guy is really probably the most selective big hitter I've ever seen. Just another day at the office yesterday at Camden Yards, four for five, a home run, four RBI. You know, he had a great year last year, and you look at it this year, look where he is. I mean, this time last year, everybody thought he's having a great year. Ray Durham leads things off for the White Sox against Justin Thompson. And takes ball one. Durham batting 254. Thompson misses inside 2 0. Kenny, it'll be interesting to watch Justin Thompson work because, as you mentioned, he was on the DL. Sometimes you're not real sharp coming back, might feel a little too strong. 3 0 the count for the leadoff man, Ray Durham, who has enjoyed tremendous success here at Tiger Stadium in 13 games, batting 466. Three and one. And when I say feeling strong, somebody will say, what do you mean feeling too strong? You should feel too strong. If you're too strong, you don't have the feel of the ball. You might not have your control. Thompson works his way back. It's now three balls, two strikes for the White Sox leadoff batter. Second baseman, Ray Durham. Kenny, he does something interesting that a lot of pitchers cannot do. He can grip a ball across the four seams, which is normally a straight fastball, and make his fastball run in on right-handed hitters. Away to left-handed, there's just naturally. The 
payoff pitch, and Duro raises that 466 average here in Detroit. Long turnaround first, and now heads back. So the leadoff man is on for the White Sox here at the top of the first. Now, this is also the way you're supposed to round first base, but here's the pitch. It was down in the zone. Ray Durham hits it through the left side. Travis Fryman just can't get to it, but I'll tell you, the, the turn that Ray Durham took at first base is the way it's supposed to be done, and that forces the defense to jump up and get the ball. If you make a turn at first base and it looks like you're going to go to second base every time you do it, the outfield defenders get nervous and start running up on the ball and might miss one. Here's Mike Cameron working on an eight-game hitting streak. Inside for a ball, Durham with 21 steals on the air, but he has been caught 12 times. Well, also, you've got to get a feel for a left-hander because Justin Thompson is not real quick to the plate. He's about 1-4, which means he's not quick. But being a left-hander, he keeps the runners fairly close. And here he keeps Durham close. See, now that's not a great move. He's got a better move than that. But what happens in some of the great base runners I've ever been around, you can see Ray Durham looking over to see if he gets a read on. Now, he might know him already. They probably looked at films ahead of time. They know how quick he is to the plate. And Maury Wills, the great base dealer with the Dodgers, used to say he liked to run against left-handers because he's looking at the open side. He can see everything he's doing. And a lot of times against the left-handed pitcher, the run on first move means they'll just guess that he's not coming over. Thompson to first once again. And I never had our pitchers throw over too often. If we didn't have a real good move, I didn't want our pitchers throwing over because that's how they learned the move. The base runner sees enough throws over, then he can go. Cameron fouls it back, one and one. Now that was interesting. That was a little bit of a different move because when Justin Thompson came to the plate, he kicked his right knee back just a little bit, back toward his left hip, and it froze Ray Durham to the point, and you can see Ray just looking there, trying to get the signs from Doug Rader at third base, the third base coach. But he didn't get a good read just a minute ago on that pitch. Now he's inching off now. This is a great shot here. Now that's a step off and throw. That's one of those things. They, that was a Dave Rigetti move. That's the first guy I've ever seen do that. So by planting that seed also in the base runner's mind, now he doesn't know what he's going to do. Is he going to lift his leg? He's going to step back off and throw, but we'll see. Thompson to the plate. And this is high and outside. Two balls, one strike to count. Uh, Mike Cameron with Ray Durham down at first base. And Frank Thomas waiting on deck. Two one. Now two and two. Wow, that was a crackling fastball up in the strike zone. Mike Cameron is a pretty good high ball hitter. The young man who's just having a, a good start in pro ball, but the ball's a little too high. As you can see, it's just above the letters. When somebody throws 91, 92, 93, it's tough to get your hands on top of that pitch and catch up. This is a good count to run right here. Durham stays home. Cameron fouls it off. And you say, well, why is it a good count to run two and two? Because it's a count a lot of pitchers and catchers feel a little more comfortable throwing a breaking ball. They don't like to throw breaking balls three and two for fear they're going to walk another runner on. Two and two, they, they kind of feel, well, that's my last chance to throw a breaking ball. And if the base runner knows it's a breaking ball, he gets a better jump. It's a slower pitch to the to the plate, and also there's a possibility of being in the dirt. Thompson once again over to first base. But did you see how easily Ray Durham got back? He read that right away. Now, unless Justin Thompson brings his leg to the same spot that he just brought it on that throw over. Ray Dorn might have a read on him now. This is the game within the game, boy. I'll tell you what, as a catcher, you love this when a pitcher holds that runner close for you. Two-two. So Cameron stays alive. Durham bluff. And then headed back towards first. But I, I, I don't know whether he was just, he's just not, you can see him shake his head now. He, he's just not getting a feel. Now watch the knee go up. He's still not sure. He knew he didn't have enough of a jump to go. 
He's still not sure whether Justin Thompson, when he brings his right leg up back toward his left hip, whether he's going to the plate over to first. This time to the plate, and he strikes out by Cameron. So Thompson holds Durham on first base. Sends Cameron back to the dugout. And the task at hand now is Frank Thomas. A leading hitter in the American League. Thompson's teammate on the American League All-Star team. Inside for a ball. Thomas only one for six lifetime against Justin Thompson. Well, we'll show you a hit zone, and it'll show you why that first pitch was inside. See, the blue areas is where Frank is vulnerable. As you notice, there aren't a lot of, there's not a lot of room where he's vulnerable. Ball Frank, one and one. But Frank Thomas, when he first came up and I was managing the White Sox, I wanted him about five months before I got him. Larry Himes, our general manager at the time, said, no, you can't have him yet. He's not ready defensively. I said, I don't care about his defense. He sure makes our lineup look different, but he is the biggest, most select big hitter I've ever seen. Do you think he's ready yet? <laughs> I think he proved he was ready that year. That was 1990. We got him by August, and he proved right away that he was a big ligger. For a big guy and some of your great home run hitters, and he is a good power hitter, can hit the ball out anywhere, is more of a, a breaking ball hitter than fastball hitter. He hits breaking balls very well. And he fouls this one off. Clark gets chase. Lands in the second row. Two balls, two strikes with... Albert Bell waiting on deck. Ray Durham, the runner, down at first base. One out in the top of the first. Now, that hit zone we saw, we talked about the areas that he's vulnerable inside. That pitch was in on his hands. We could hear up here Frank say when he swung it out, that ball got down on the bat. He was just lucky and happy that that ball got out of play. The 2-2 two -two from Thompson. And Thomas drills it foul. Back behind third base. And he broke the bat in the process. Well. Mm -mm -mm. Look at that. And there, there's a guy still a young man. And that's six first six seasons, six full seasons for him. Look what he has done and look at the company he's in. My gosh, that's unbelievable. Do you play with Hal Trotsky? Uh, he was just before me. Just by a couple of years. <laughs> Thompson over to first. You know, what you want to do if you're a pitcher and a catcher when you're facing Frank Thomas, first of all, you'd like not to throw the pitch. But when you do throw the pitch, you've got to make sure you stay out of the middle where he gets his arms extended. He'll chase bad breaking stuff down and away, but boy, can he just murder mistakes. He has murdered 22 mistakes this season, including one yesterday in Baltimore. Batting 400 with five home runs since the All-Star break. And Thomas throws this one. There is the state, number 23. Dropped in. He's a good breaking ball hitter, and this is a curveball down in the middle of the plate. And Frank just used one big arm. Now here's the pitch. Watch it's a breaking ball. Watch Frank Thomas get extension. One hand, upper deck. Boy, this guy is some kind of strong, but he loves the off-speed pitch. Well, Thompson threw over to first at least seven times. Keep Durham close. It did not matter. No, and sometimes that can divide your concentration and your attention, especially with a good hitter up there. Here's another good one. Albert Bell, who takes ball one. Heard the boos from the crowd here at Tiger Stadium. Many of the Tiger fans feel that had Bell declined the All-Star invitation, their first baseman, Tony Clark, may have been selected. I agree. That that was a mess. Uh, it's a shame. This guy seems to somehow get himself in more gosh darn altercations or controversial situations. The guy is an outstanding hitter, but he can't seem to have social relationships, you know, in the game, within the game itself without causing a problem. 
And he accidentally taps that down to Clark. Two away. Although Albert Bell did say following the All-Star game that he did not ask to be held out, that in fact it was Joe Torre's decision, the manager of the American League All-Stars. But in any event, Bell bounces out to Clark down at first base, so it's two away. Here's the right fielder, Lyle Mouton. You know, when he was introduced in the All-Star game and they booed him after having almost given Kenny Lofton a standing ovation, he could have diffused all of that by smiling, raising his hand, saying, okay, I understand. He didn't. You know, you don't fight things like that. Lyle Mouton batting 283. Four home runs, 20 runs batted in. One and one. You know, this is a good-looking player, Lyle Mouton. Another great big guy, six foot four, about 240 pounds, former basketball player out of LSU. And Mouton with a base hit into left field. A number of former college basketball players dot the rosters of these two clubs. You mentioned Mouton, Curtis Pride of the Tigers. Yes. Played collegiately at William & Mary. Tony Clark at both Arizona and San Diego State. So Mouton is on with the White Sox third base hit of the first inning. Well, you talk so much about how the hitters are weight training now are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And back in 65, I think there were only three guys that weighed 240. You've got three guys once back, back to back to back in this White Sox lineup at about 240 or more. Harold Baines takes ball one. Baines with a hit in six consecutive games. Up to 296. Ironically, the White Sox starting pitcher tonight, Wilson Alvarez, was acquired from the Texas Rangers in the deal which sent Baines down to Arlington. Well, I was managing. That was 1989, July 29, 1989, and we were a team that was not very good at the time. In fact, the worst team in baseball at the break, and, and soon after, we made the trade. When we sent Harold down with Fred Manrique, in return, we received Wilson Alvarez, Scott Fletcher, and Sammy Sosa, and we became immediately a better ball club. And not because we didn't have Harold Baines, but because we, the same night we brought up Lance Johnson. So two-thirds of our outfield could fly. Scott Fletcher moved into second base, and that was the start of the White Sox starting to have good teams right about that time. Two and two. Pitch number 29 of this first inning for Justin Thompson. And the Tigers said they will limit Thompson today to between 80 and 90 pitches following his stint on the 15-day to save a list. Break ball misses three and two. And an inning that's a tough inning like this where you're really worrying, you got runners at first base, just think, you're talking about the number of pitches he's thrown. How about all the throws at first base in there also? And he throws a lot of breaking balls. Breaking balls take it, their toll on your arm as well. And Thompson strikes out Harold Baines to retire the side, but not before, home run number 23 of the season off the bat of the Big Hurt. Welcome back to Tiger Stadium, Major League Monday on FX. Kenny Albert with Jeff Torborg. White Sox out to a two-run lead as we take a look at our shell lineups. The Tigers batting order tonight, and it will be Major League stolen base king in this 1997 season. Brian Hunter followed by second baseman Damian Eastley. Career year for the former Angel. Nine home runs over the last 32 games. Travis Bryman at third base. Tony Clark down at first. Phil Nevin in left field. Melvin Davis in right. Orlando Miller, the DH tonight. Matt Walbeck behind the plate. And Davey Cruz, the outstanding rookie, out at shortstop. Wilson Alvarez, the big left-hander, 6'1", 235, only 27 years of age, has been in the Major League seven years. Excellent stuff. As we mentioned earlier, his first start with the White Sox, his second Major League start against Baltimore, he pitched a no-hitter. And he has shown signs of brilliance over the years, and he's really starting to step it up. These are pretty good numbers. Part of this 8-7 and seven record is, and on some games, they just didn't give him any support early in the year, but he is a very effective pitcher. Alvarez coming off his worst outing of the season against the Yankees. He allowed 10 runs on nine hits. As Brian Hunter takes strike one. But prior to that game last Wednesday, 
Alvarez had allowed only seven earned runs in his previous eight starts. Hunter up to 263, the highest his average has been all season long. But the key number, the 48 stolen bases, which leads the majors. But well, one of the things Wilson Alvarez has had a problem with in the past is not challenging hitters. He tends to nibble a little bit. He's got an outstanding fastball, just like Thompson. Runs all over the place. Good curveball and slider. But his problem is sometimes he doesn't challenge hitters enough. Curveball smashed to shortstop. Marquee to cross to Thomas. One away here at the bottom of the first. As we take a look at the White Sox defensively with Ron Karkovic behind the plate. His first start since June 23rd, his first appearance since June 28th. Thomas, Durham, Martin, and Snowpeck with Bell, Cameron, and Mouton. White Sox tied for the last spot in the American League in fielding percentage. 85 errors on the season. Ball one to Damian Eastley. Well, it's an interesting story about Karkovic. Ron Karkovic was the catcher the day that Wilson Alvarez pitched a no-hitter and had been the incumbent here, but uh, he had knee surgeries, had a couple knee surgeries, got two bad knees, and then he mistakenly said a couple things to the media earlier in the year about his manager. Oh, Eastley chased that one, one and one. Now, that was an outstanding changeup. Wilson Alvarez also, the go with his curveball and slider, has a good change. But Ron Karkovic came out after a game that the White Sox had lost and, and second-guessed a little in his comments, Terry Bevington, the White Sox manager. That does not go over too well. Now back one and two. It's amazing how much you can say when you're hitting 300 and or 20-some home runs or something, but when you're hitting 190, you better keep quiet. And Karko's a good guy. I think maybe, I don't know if he's misquoted or he just emotionally was upset over the way the game went, but if you've got a problem with the manager, you take it to the manager. You don't go out in the papers and criticize your manager or your teammates. That's, that's awful. Two and two. The count on Damian Eastley. Back in mid-May, the White Sox acquired Jorge Fabregas from the Angels in the Tony Phillips deal. And Fabregas has taken over the role as the White Sox starting catcher, relegating both Karkovic and Tony Pena to the bench. Well, we just had a shot at Terry Bevington in the dugout, and, you know, Terry says it has nothing. That's Joe Nosick uh, to Terry's right, to our left. Terry said it has nothing, uh, Cargo's not playing, to do with what he said. But I'll tell you what, that hurts, because they've been together a long time. Terry was a coach for me and been around Cargo. And Eastley hits this one deep to left. Bell going back, and he makes the catch on the warning track. Fly ball out. Damian Eastley already with a career high 14 home runs. His previous high was six. And he misses by a couple of feet, hitting number 15. Well, this is Travis Feynman standing up now, and he is a guy that has really been, when this club has been down, a one of their toughest hitters. You can see in the hit zone, he likes the ball in the middle end. Fryman has struggled. It only 186 during the Tigers' recent 11-game road trip, which concluded last night a 10-inning 7-6 loss down in Texas. The Tigers 4-7 during the trip, which included a coast-to-coast red-eye without an off day in between. They played in Boston, 6:05 start at Fenway, but the game went 12 innings, and the Tigers played in Anaheim the next night. Coming on is the right fielder, Mouton. And that will do it for the Tigers. One, two, three inning for Wilson Alvarez. Frank Thomas' 23rd home run of the season. And then a quick one, two, three inning for Wilson Alvarez. And now Justin Thompson will face Chris Stopek, Ron Karkovic, and Norberto Martin. In the top of the second inning, Snowpeck, the starting third baseman for most of the season following the spring training injury suffered by Robin Ventura, who is expected to return within the next week. He's rehabbing down in the minor leagues. Snowpeck recently went through an 0 for 19 slump, but he has hit in his last two at bats since then. 
boy, they really miss Robin Ventura. First of all, they miss his gold glove. Snowpeck has 14 errors, and even Norberto Martinez filled in has struggled at third base. They miss his glove, but the big left-handed bat really balances off the lineup. Uh, when you think about a ball club that has the kind of errors that the White Sox have, it does not help your pitching staff, which is struggling also. Strike two call, two and two. Yes, Snowpeck with 14 of those errors. As Perry Bevington will certainly welcome back perennial all-star Robin Ventura. In the dirt, full count. So Thompson, who threw over 30 pitches in the first inning, adding to those numbers. We mentioned earlier he normally would be in the 100-plus range, but the Buddy Bell said earlier today that Thompson would be limited to between 80 and 90, and he is over one-third of the way there. As we mentioned earlier, just going to make sure they protect him. Don't take a chance to hurt this good arm. Brown ball to the shortstop. Cruz, one away in the second. Well, that's another story in Detroit. This Davy Cruz. This is only a young kid who came up uh, from the Midwest League. Now he's struggling a little bit with the bat, but man, he can pick it. You know, and there are so many good young shortstop around. I just came from watching Ray or Ordonez in. Chase Stadium with the Mets and Derek Jeter with the Yankees. Ron Karkovich takes strike one. And there are so many good young shortstops around. Uh, Alex Rodriguez up with Seattle. I mean, batting champion of the American League. You're talking about some great young talented players. Karkovich pops it up. The pitch is Thompson calling for it on the top of the mound, and he makes the catch. Well, you don't see that very often where the pitcher catches the ball. He's normally called off, but that didn't go very high. And, uh, it's kind of a funny thing to see the pitcher really waving everybody else on the mound off. He said, I got it, I got it. He's making sure nobody runs into him here. So two away for Norberto Martin. Big game yesterday, season high three hits. Three for five, a pair of RBI. Seven for his last 18. Thompson settling down a bit here in the second after allowing the two run homer off the bat of Frank Thomas in the first inning. Thompson's first start since July 5th. He pitched one inning in the All Star game and retired the National League 1 2 3. Pitched the fifth inning following Randy Johnson, Roger Clemens. And David Cohn, not bad company for the Tigers' Lone Hall Star representative. The 0 2 from Thompson, missing outside, 1 and 2. Kenny, we were talking before about the kind of grip that he uses on his fastball. A lot of guys will use a two, two seam grip. He gets a four seam grip right across him and gets action. Smash foul down the right field line. See, what you normally teach kids or anybody that's playing any position on the field to grab the ball across the four seams that makes it a true throw. Well, he just sets the grip ahead of time, puts the ball in his glove, and then gets back on it. He goes across the seams, which for most people would straighten the ball out. For him, it jumps around. Oh, right back through the middle for a base hit. A line drive, and I'm sure for Thompson brought back memories of his teammate Willie Blair, who uh, suffered a broken jaw earlier this season with a liner off the bat of Julio Franco. Well, I'll tell you what, this wasn't hit as hard as he thought it was. He hit a changeup back at him. I don't think he hit it very well. Probably down in the hands of his bat. Yeah. And he thought it was harder hit than it was. See, this ball is barely going to make it to the grass. And he's diving before it ever gets there. It's easy for me to laugh about. But, you know, remember, he's only 60 feet 6 inches when he starts from the hitter. Ray Durham bounces off. Thompson's first pitch. All and one. So the number nine man, Martin, on at first with two outs. Durham single. Came around to score on the Thomas home run. We mentioned Thompson's last start was July 5th. He then pitched in the All-Star game July 8th. 
was placed on the disabled list, Jeff, July 11th, retroactive to July 6th, which means technically he pitched in the All-Star game while on the disabled list, <laughs> retroactively. Well, Rick Adair, the pitching coach, told me what happened was after the All-Star game, game, they came back and he had a workout day and he started throwing on the sideline. He didn't feel very good. Arm didn't feel good. So, you know, that's a red flag going up. They said, oh, no, we're not taking a chance with this kid. So they immediately backed him down. Three and one. He missed two months last year with a sore shoulder. Also missed the entire 94 season with elbow problems, although referring to this recent injury, Thompson said, I've been through pain. This isn't pain. As you mentioned, just precautionary. Right. He's had a nerve problem in the back of his shoulder. So, man, that really hurts. And for a youngster, that's got to scare you, thinking your career's over. Another base hit for the White Sox. Durham two for two. And after Thompson retired, the first two Chicago batters here in the second, all of a sudden, they have runners on first and second with the meat of the order coming up. And here comes pitching coach Rick Adair. Now this White Sox ball club really struggled early in the year. Part of it had to do with the weather. The weather was horrible in the Midwest and the Northeast. And you can see what they did in April. April's a terrible month. Look at the difference. 8 and 17 in April and since then 41 and 30. And look at the numbers. I mean, it's incredible. The power numbers come up. I've always felt that veteran hitting teams have trouble in the real cold weather because they're good. They've, they've hit. They know the feeling of good hitting. Young kids go out there and they wail away. But good hitters, as the White Sox are veteran hitters, had a tough time in the real cold weather. And since it started to warm up, so have they. Here's Mike Cameron who struck out back in the first. Martin the runner on second. Durham at first base. Two away at... Thompson misses high and outside. Ball one. Kenny, one of the things you talk about in baseball when you're looking at a pitcher is a guy who's a maximum effort guy. That means he's grunting and jumping and really firing with all his might on every pitch. Right now, Justin Thompson is doing that. He's not smooth. He's really fighting. High and tight. Two and oh. See how hard he's throwing? One of the best things if you can teach a pitcher when he gets into trouble is back it off. Throw easier rather than throwing harder. First of all, get you a feel of the ball, throws the hitter off, but you stop overthrowing because normally overthrowing goes with rushing through your delivery as well. Three balls, no strikes. So Thompson within one ball of loading the bases with Frank Thomas due up next. See, now look at this delivery. He had not, he had started to the plate before he even turned his head from looking at second base. And that'll throw you off because if your head's in movement, your, follow, your body will follow your head right through the zone. He walks Cameron on four pitches with the bases loaded. Here comes Frank Thomas. Wow, this is not good. He's at 53 pitches already. 30 strikes and 23 balls. And as I mentioned early in the game, one of the things you worry about is, in being, is a pitcher who's laid off for a little while being a little too strong. Being a little too strong means that he keeps trying to throw too hard. And they've already got a pitcher up behind him in the bullpen. Kevin Jarvis. Kevin Jarvis. Warming up down to the Tigers' pen. Base is loaded. Two outs. Frank Thomas homered in the last inning. Now that was a good live fastball. That ran in on Frank Thomas almost like a cutter would or a true slider would. That's the kind of fastball he has. But he has got to throw hard stuff on Frank's hands. Inside ball two. So six consecutive balls. Martin the runner down at third. Durham on second. Cameron at first base. Nowhere to put Frank Thomas. Two balls, no strikes. Now three and up. So now's the situation. You're Terry Bevington. You're managing the White Sox. You know you got one of the most selective hitters in baseball at the plate. You've got to let him hit here and let him decide whether it's a cripple pitch that he wants. Right one call by the home plate umpire, Joe Rivera. Four career grand slams. 397 mm. with the bases full. 
The 3 1 from Thompson. Foul back into the booth just to our right. Hey, what is dangerous up here? I should have brought my catcher's glove and my uh, mask with me. We are sitting very close to the field here. When I used to coach and manage down on this field or play here, I knew it looked close. But it looks a lot closer from here. And it will look even closer should a ball come in here. <laughs> Runners on the move. And Thomas looks it to right. Coming on is the Ennis. And that will do it for the White Sox. So Justin Thompson looks out of the bases loaded down. Justin Thompson says, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, and Frank Thomas tagged him for the two-run shot in the first, and then in the second inning, Thompson gets Thomas to fly out to right with the bases loaded and two away. Here's Tony Clark, one of the biggest stories in baseball this season that uh, the majority of folks around the U.S. have not heard too much about. Is that a pun, one of the biggest? He's six foot eight. 250 pounds. I guarantee he's the biggest switch hitter that ever played this game at the major league level. He's fallen behind. No balls, two strikes. Wilson Alvarez working the bottom of the second inning. Clark stays alive. Now we're talking about a youngster who they weren't even sure was going to play baseball. He thought so highly of him. Look at the numbers this season. 23 home runs, which is ranked sixth in the American League, 77 RBIs, 65 walks here, is a young, big-time star in the making. The 0-2 from Alvarez, one ball, two strikes. When the Tigers traded Cecil Fielder to the Yankees last July, that opened the door for Tony Clark to step in. Sure did. That's what they had in mind. I, you know, it's an amazing job with Buddy Bell and Randy Smith. Buddy, of course, the field manager, Randy Smith, the general manager. What they've done with the nucleus of this ball club, because a year ago, this team was a mess. Here's the one-two. Clark bounces it to third. Snow pack across to Thomas, one away. At the bottom of the second. That's last year, 53 and 109. Tigers have already improved 15 games compared to their record at this time a year ago. I could not believe the job that Buddy Bell and his coaching staff did last year. Buddy Bell never got his head down. There's a shot of him. He was a captain for me when I first got a managing job with the Indians back in the 70s. Terrific guy. Comes from a great family. You know, talking three generations of major league players. His father, Gus, was an all-star player with Cincinnati and Pittsburgh and Milwaukee. There's Phil Devin who takes ball one. In fact, it just shows what a job they did despite the 109 losses in the fact that one of his coaches, Terry Francona, was hired following last season to manage the Philadelphia Phillies. Niven through the left side for the first base hit for the Tigers off Alvarez here tonight. The one-out single by left fielder Phil Nevin. Well, the Tigers have, yeah, when you think about Terry Francona, what he's gone through in two years now, good baseball guy and if he watched what buddy did and i know he did kept his head up was patient with his players was very very understanding and tried to teach and pat him on the back but buddy was a tough competitor but he also was a classy guy and he's really shown that and larry Parrish is next to him but this club has improved in a lot of areas and one of the places they had to improve dramatically was in the pitching staff because they were awful last year setting a record but look at the difference this year and last year look at the runs that they've given up Fewer runs this year. Now that is quite a stat. Last year they set the American League record for worst earned run average. And they've cut that down by over. They were awful last year setting a record. But look at the difference this year and last year. Look at the runs that they've given up. Fewer runs this year. Now that is quite a stat. Last year they set the American League record for worst Earned run average, and they've cut that down by over a run and a half per game. Complete games, home runs, limited home runs, because this is a small ballpark. This can intimidate your pitching staff here. Melvin Nieves leads the majors in strikeouts, but he has also homered in four of his last six games. 
This guy is one of those all or nothing guys. You know, he's got a big swing. He's got a hole up in the swing on both sides of the plate. But make a mistake on him, and he can hit a ball a long way. You talk about all or nothing. His wife's expecting twins any day now. <laughs> he's consistent. Here's a 2 0, and he has fouls it off. You know, this is such a good place to hit in this ballpark. If you're able to drive the ball the other way and you use the whole field. Now, center field is a long way away. It's 440 feet out the center. But if you turn and hit a ball, as you can see, Mike Cameron is playing very deep right now. And the wall is still a good, oh, what, 80, 90 feet behind him. But if you shoot the ball to right field here, you're a good right field hitter. As a right-handed hitter, you can drop it in the upper deck here. Here's a 2-1 from Alvarez. And the first base umpire, Dale Scott, says strike two. Well, as we so often say, the umpires are almost always right, especially on this call. They get a good look at the naked eye. Doesn't look like they go. And that was one where he just carried it a little bit too far over the plate, and Dale Scott had to look from the side. But I used to complain on this in the dugout all the time with a naked eye, or even when I was catching, but they're almost always right. Called strike three. So the Evans. Goes down on strikes for the 119th time this season, more than any other major leaguer. Now this ball was a crackling fastball at Pooley. Ron Carker bites the set up inside, and this is a fastball that just kept running. And at the last minute, it was almost like a little giddy up on it. Now Evans was just locked up. Look at it, boom. That wasn't straight. That ball had a little movement to it. And I think that's what fooled Melvin. Here's Orlando Miller with two away. And the Tigers designated hitter takes strike one. Miller batting 254 on the season. Hit 15 home runs last year with the Houston Astros. Two outs, bottom of the second. And time is called. Alvarez steps off. Alvarez six and three lifetime against the Tigers two and zero last year. Perfect three and zero here at Tiger Stadium, and he holds Nevin on at first base. Nevin has not even attempted to steal a base this season. You know, a lot of people say, "Why would you throw over there? The guy's not going to run. The team is down by two runs. It's just kind of a show me that I'm aware of you." Miller to the plate. Breaking ball misses for ball one. Remember Wilson Alvarez when I mentioned that he pitched that no hitter in his first start ever for the White Sox in August of 1991. Comes back in the next game against the Yankees and gets lit up and we couldn't figure it out at first until we realized that he was giving his pitches away. He was showing his curveball and Greg Nettles who was such a great third baseman an outstanding hitter with the Yankees you know was really adept at that. Probably the, the, the best I've ever seen was Frank Robinson. And, and of course, the kind of hitter he was. And if he knew what was coming, boy, could he do damage. But Nettles got his pitches. So we had to make sure that he hit his ball, the ball on his grip of his curveball and his glove. Because everybody out there is trying to watch to pick some things up. 1-1, one, one, high and inside, 2-1. How yeah. about in the no-hitter? Did he not show the pitches during the no-hitter? Well, he might have shown them, and we weren't aware of them, but the Orioles weren't either. And even maybe in that game, if they were, they could have hit them anyway. You know, I used to hear that when Sandy Koufax was pitching, they knew it was coming when there were runners on base, the way he held his, his arms when he was in a set position. But it didn't matter, I guess. Oh, Miller takes a big cut. Two and two. That was a high changeup, and that... When you see a guy who has good live fastball, like Wilson Alvarez does, and then his arm action is very quick, like his fastball, and he throws the changeup, look out, throws the hitter off. Way out in front. Two outs, 2-2 two -two count on Orlando Miller. And a pitch from Alvarez. Ball three, so the count is full. With Phil Nevin, the runner down at first base. He just did something I don't like. He did what you call the slide step or the quick step. Didn't lift his leg. He was trying to fool the base runner. 
Base runner's not going anywhere. Now he's three and two. If you slide step in a situation, there are times to do that. Early in the count, it can throw you off. Instead of lifting his leg, he slid it. And Miller strikes out. Second consecutive strikeout for Alvarez. And that does it for the Tigers in the second. Tiger Stadium, where the White Sox lead the Tigers by the score of 2-0. Uh, Major League Monday on FX. And a reminder to all our fans, you can send your questions to Jeff and I via email tonight. The MCI Interactive Fan lets you talk to us about the game or anything else currently taking place in Major League Baseball. Two viewers will have their questions asked and answered on the air. The address, MCI at FoxSports.net. Albert Bell grabs the first pitch from Justin Thompson to the second baseman, Eastley. And Bell is thrown out, so a quiet night so far. Two infield ground outs for Albert Bell. Well, Jeff, there is White Sox first base coach, Ron Jackson, returning to the coaching box tonight. Skipped yesterday's game in Baltimore to attend his parents' 50th anniversary celebration down in Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, that's wonderful. This is one of the good guys in the game. His nickname is Papa Jack, and he is really he was a terrific player. Excellent coach. The guys really relate to him. Hard worker. There's Lyle Bouton who singled in the first. You know how we talk about how the fans get on Albert Bell? He hit that ground ball to second base and didn't run it out. And when Eastley booted the ball, he was only a little ways out of the batter's box. That's what turns people off. Bouton fouls it off. You know, I know if you hit a line drive right to somebody, and it's okay, you're out in the bang bang, you're out. But what really aggravates people is that there's a guy making what 10, 11 million a year, and he doesn't run out of ground ball, and that, and, and it, then he says, "Why me? Why is everyone on me?" Strike three. So Bouton becomes strikeout victim number three. Two away here in the third. Getting back to Ron Jackson. Must have been some bash yesterday down in Alabama. Ron, one of 14 children. <laughs> His parents celebrating their 50th anniversary. Bill Buckner handled the coaching chores down at first base, and Ron has five children himself. Would they be referred to as the Jackson Five? <laughs> I guess so. Well, here's Harold Baines, who struck out back in the first inning. So Thompson has settled out a bit following that first inning, although he did load the bases in the second with two away. Two quick outs here in the third as well. One and two the count on Harold Baines with two away. Top of the third inning. From Tiger Stadium. I am tight two and two. Well, Kenny, you're talking about how he settled down, and one of the things you think about as a youngster like this is getting the feel, and it shows something in poise that he stayed with it. Baines bounces it up the middle, face hit just out of the reach of a diving Damian Eastlake. So, as was the case in the second inning with two outs. Thompson cannot finish off the White Sox. Baines on with his first hit of the ball game. And Chris Snowpeck steps to the plates. Snowpeck grounded out to the shortstop. Cruz back in the second inning. Well, with that base hit, Jarvis got back up in the bullpen again. And you can just see what Buddy Bell's thinking here. He is not going to force this kid's arm, you know, get in another tough inning and really force it too much. And I think that's 69 pitches for him already. And as you mentioned earlier, that is a major concern. Even though he settled down a little bit, you're still counting the pitches the same way. And Snowpack throws this one to right. The MS makes the catch. Sitting in his throat, a high number of pitches through three. And as he leaves the field, Buddy Bell will come over and talk to him. And Buddy loves this kid. He says he's got great poise. But this is what goes on in the dugout. This is how Buddy is building this kid's confidence and this team's belief in itself. He stays with his players, and he's there communicating with them. I've been on some ball clubs where the managers don't even bother. You know, it's almost like, ah, you messed up. Don't even bother. Here's the catcher, Matt Walbeck. 0 
Well, Buddy Bell, a couple of weeks back, said, I feel we will win every game Justin Thompson pitches. Showing a lot of confidence in the 24-year-old left-hander. In his first major league season. 0-1 oh, the count on Walbeck, who broke his wrist back in April. Lost the starting job to Raul Casanova. Brian Johnson, who also saw a significant amount of playing time earlier, was subsequently traded to the San Diego Padres. And tonight, a rare start for Walbeck. Walbeck was a real hot prospect a few years ago, and he's starting to swing the bat now. His last 18 at bats, he's hitting over 400. Here's the 0-2 from Alvarez, and Walbeck stays alive. Well, that was a 90-mile-an-hour fastball that Wilson Alvarez got up there, and he gets it up. One of the things that if you look at a delivery, if the delivery is smooth, doesn't it's not jumping, whirling dervish, it fools the hitters when the ball comes up that hard out of a nice, easy delivery. And Wilson doesn't overpower you with a delivery. Look how smooth it is. Cold strike three. So Alvarez strikes out Walbeck. Third consecutive strikeout for Alvarez. Well, Jeff, don't miss FX Prime Time Tuesday through Saturday. Leading off is the A team, followed by TV's most stylish detectives, Crockett and Tubbs, on Miami Vice. Then it's the side putting comedy of Jim Carrey and the cast of In Living Color every Tuesday through Saturday, starting at 8. One place, FX. Well, here's Davy Cruz, the rookie shortstop, whom you spoke about earlier. Cruz has made the jump from single A. All the way up to the major leagues. Rule five draft pick off the roster of the San Francisco Giants. And when we talk about rule five draft, if it's a rule five draft at the major league level, they have to stay on that ball club. Or if the club isn't going to keep them, they're offered back to their original ball club for half the amount, 25000 Cruz has had trouble at the plate this year, but has been splendid in the field. Made only seven errors, none in the last 20 games. And they feel anything off the bat from Cruz is a bonus. I was talking to a couple of the scouts tonight before the game, and those who have followed this ball club said, you ought to see this kid play day in and day out. He really is terrific with a glove. And, you know, that shortstop position is the one that you, if you sacrifice some offensive ability to catch the ball, you don't mind. Two and two. Brian Hunter waiting on deck. Cruz just 22 years of age. There's Hunter. Cruz fouls it back. Cruz, despite the 220 average, working on a four game hit streak. Alvarez has allowed only one hit. He struck out three in a row. Just misses. Three balls, two strikes. Here's the pitch to Cruz. Held up, ball four. So, maybe Cruz heads down to first base. First one. Pull out tonight by Alvarez. Now, Brian Hunter came over to Detroit from Houston. He was a hot prospect in Houston. and He's not your prototypical leadoff hitter, but he can make things happen. And I always had a feeling watching him. If you gave him some time, he'd get it together. Now, look what he's done here. Started to get comfortable. Struggled through the first 68 games, hitting 219. 19 RBIs. He was stealing bases when he got on. He's really turned it up a notch. And if you watch him, he's got a great big swing. He's a big kid. He's not one of these little... Uh, guys that bends over as a leadoff hitter he's six foot four and he's got a big swing and it's not your typical leadoff hitter swing he strikes out too much up in that in that role but the more he plays and gets comfortable here in Detroit the better he's going to become fouls it back Bruce the runner on first one ball one strike to count on Brian Hunter now this big swing we're talking about look at this look how big it is Whoa, this big long swing with a big high leg kick. 
That's a home run hitter swing. He's not your typical home run hitter. He's a guy you want to get on base, take advantage of his speed. You don't like to see that big a swing. That means you've got an awful big hole in the swing. The one one from Alvarez. Hunter fouls it back. Hunter, as you mentioned, came over from the Houston organization. And he said one of his goals down the line is to be talked about in the same breath as Kenny Lofton as far as center fielders whom the Astros let get away. Well, that's pretty good company. Uh, Kenny doesn't swing like this, though. And I think, you know, one of the things is not everybody can hit the same way. I don't mean that. But you'd like to see him put the ball in play. He struck out 90 sometimes last year. And that, that's really taken away from your ability. Lance Johnson, for an example, when he came up with the White Sox, had a little bigger swing. He flattened it out. And now in two consecutive years, he led, and the only man in the history of baseball to lead his league, and each league, I should say, the first the American League with the White Sox and the National League with the Mets last year in number of base hits. Well, Brian Hunter could, down the road, probably do the same thing. But this big swing and only get five home runs or so out of it is, you know, that's not conducive. Cruz back at first. Cruz has stolen three bases this year. He's been caught four times. Alvarez to the plate. And Hunter fouls it down the first base line. So the count remains. Two balls, two strikes with one away. Bottom of the third inning from Tiger Stadium. Two nothing White Sox lead. Thanks to the two-run first inning home run. 23rd of the season hit by Frank Thomas. Alvarez misses inside. So the count is now full to Brian Hunter. Now you can see what... Ron Karkovice was trying to lead Wilson Alvarez to there. He was trying to throw a fastball by Brian Hunter underneath his hands, having seen the big swing, except the ball was down, and they're going from the signs of Karkovice. First of all, he said, no, now I think they're going back in there again. Yeah. Here's the payoff. The Hunter bounces it. Nice grab by Snowpack. Fires across. And they get Hunter at first. Cruz moves down to second. Nice job. By the third baseman, Chris Stopak. That was a nice play, and he knew that he had to get the ball over to first base in a hurry, too. He didn't mess around. When you've got a, a base runner with the kind of speed that Hunter has, it'll give you an idea beforehand. You know what you got to do. Now, here's Stopak. He didn't, he didn't take a couple short steps. He grabbed the ball and threw a bullet to first base because he knows Hunter is going to be really getting down that line. So with two away, Damian Eastley steps in. Wide out to Albert Bell and left on the warning track in the first inning. Cruz, the runner on second. Breaking ball is in for strike one. That curveball is a tough pitch to get called for a strike by some people. Derwood Merrill really stayed with that pitch. He didn't quit on it. You see a curveball come out of a pitcher's hand high. A lot of times you just both the hitter and the umpire give up on it. He, Derwood stayed right on it. That's a nice shot from center field. That's good camera work watching Ron Karkovice block that ball. He blocked that ball and took his head down to it and blocked off the hole between his legs. And you can see him giving his signs and you can show where it's going to go. He wants to run something back inside on Damien Eastley. I think a breaking ball. And he misses low and away. Two and one. Now Wilson Alvarez had Economized on his pitches the first two innings, and he's struggling a little bit this inning. That walk, anytime you get a walk in an inning like that, or you got some guy fouling the ball off and then have some strikeouts, it's that type of thing that will cause you to throw a lot of pitches. Two and two. Justin Thompson, on the other hand, threw over 30 pitches in the first inning when he faced six batters. He also loaded the bases in the second. Alvarez has allowed only two base runners. Single by Nevin in the second. And he walked 
Cruz here in the third. Cruz, the runner on second. Two outs. The 2-2 two -two pitch. Popped up in foul territory. Thomas chasing, and he makes the catch with Durham in pursuit as well. So that does it for the Tigers. Three complete here in Detroit. 2-0, White Sox lead. Applying for a home equity of the fourth inning. Two-run home run by Frank Thomas, accounting for both runs so far tonight. As we take a look at our MCI trivia question, Jeff named the 1976 Sporting News National League Rookie of the Year. And I have a feeling he is somewhere in the ballpark tonight. <laughs> I know he is. Well, also in the ballpark is Kevin Jarvis, who is the new Tigers pitcher in relief of Justin Thompson. And Ron Karkovic grounds the first pitch from Jarvis to the third baseman, Travis Priman. Well, Kevin Jarvis making his 11th appearance of the season. Claimed off waivers from the Minnesota Twins back in mid-June. A week later, he was placed on the 15-day DL with a back strain activated. Just last week, he started in Boston a week ago tonight and took the loss. So Kevin Jarvis replaces Thompson, who lasted only three innings in his first start following his return from the disabled list. Thompson allowing two runs on six hits. And with one away, here's Norberto Martin who singled up the middle back in the second inning. Martin now eight of his last 19. And Martin, as was the case with the previous batter, Karkovic also swinging at the first pitch, and he fouls it off. Every time I look at Kevin Jarvis, you remember a, a pitcher that used to pitch for the Braves, Pat Jarvis? He's yep. a sheriff somewhere now down in the south, but I still remember him being a real dog, dog, bulldog of a pitcher back in those days with the Braves. Every time I see this guy's name, I don't know why I want to call him Pat. I guess just because Jarvis was a good pitcher. Of course, Doug Jarvis, the NHL's all-time Iron Man, the Cal Ripken of the National Hockey League, playing in over 900 consecutive games. Taking one more step. Okay. <laughs> and Kevin Jarvis has worked the count to 0 and 2 to Norberto Martin with Ray Durham waiting on deck. Uh, Martin bounces it, prime it, two away here in the fourth. <laughs> Here's Ray Durham, who has singled in both of his plate appearances. Came around to score in the first inning on the Thomas home run, stranded in the second inning. Ball one. This one will not fall. The catch is made. Nevin down to his knees. Durham just inches away from making it three for three. Sam Beck, Kenny Albert with Jeff Torborg. Bottom of the fourth. Travis Fryman leads things off for the Tigers against Wilson Alvarez. Fryman fly to right back in the first inning. 0 for 1. Ryman has had tough luck throughout his career against Alvarez. Now only 6 of 33. Yeah, I'm looking at Travis Ryman. He's trying something new. He's struggling a little bit lately. He's got his stance wide open. I think he's probably been pulling off the ball. So he's got his left foot open. He's going back into the plate. One on one. And we looked at his hit zone before we saw that he liked the ball from the middle end. 
But I think probably what happened, he started when he got a little tired, started pulling off. But as you can see, his left foot is open toward the third base coach. And he's trying to bring that back toward the plate to try to keep his front side in. Now the bat one and two. And you know, it's amazing. This game is a game of making adjustments, especially at the major league level, because the pitchers and catchers are trying to make adjustments. Now, here's his swing. See him close his front foot up and go straight at the pitcher. Now, in the past, he's been somewhat square to the pitcher, and he would open up a little bit and take advantage of the short porch in left field here. But if you start square, when I say square, both feet are on a same, if you were to draw, draw a line in the dirt, your toes would be on the same line. The tendency is to pull off the ball occasionally from there. So what he's really trying to do here is force himself close. Breaking ball misses, three and two, so count is now full. Bryman, then Tony Clark, and Phil Nevin here in the fourth against Wilson Alvarez. So Fryman has been a real constant around here, and with Alan Trammell, a future Hall of Famer, gone from here. But you remember when Trammell first came up as a short, I should say, Fryman first came up as a shortstop, it was thought that he'd be the man that would replace, replace Alan Trammell when he left. And of course, Lou Whitaker and Trammell played so many years together sensational they came up together and here we're here so many years and we're just playing winners together well then Fryman moved over to third base and he's been a fixture there and an all-star there five different times he's got he doesn't look like a big power hitter they got real good pop in his bat and he lifts this one in the air to shallow center Cameron coming on makes the catch one away in the fourth <laughs> comes Tony Clark grounded out to the third baseman Snowpack back to the second inning and you can see his hit zone and right under those big long arms of the area you've got to pitch him or out of way right there and that's where that last one was and the player oh, goes nice three to one Thomas to the pitcher Alvarez two away as we return to our MCI trivia question Jeff named the 1976 Sporting News National League Rookie of the Year. Well, I know who it is because I played with him the last year I was active. Larry Herndon, what a good player, and he's a hitting coach of the Tigers. And he had originally come up with the Cardinals, and then he became a Giants player after a deal was made. But I remember him most being here with Detroit because he had a ball here that I still can't believe that went out of here. We were talking before about 440 feet to center field. Larry Herndon, an opening day, I think it was 1981 or 82, and the Yankees were in town, hit a line drive in the upper deck in center field above the 440 foot sign. Straight away center field. I've never seen anything like it here. One and one to count on Phil Nevin, who has the Tigers' only base hit, a single to left, back in the second inning. You know how sometimes uh, clubs have a, an abundance of real good young players. Those years, about 1974 with the Cardinals, they had people coming up like Jerry Mumphrey, um, Jose Cruz, Hector Cruz. Um, oh, they had a whole bunch of them. They couldn't keep them all, and Larry Herndon was one of them, so he ended up with the, the Giants and was the Rookie of the Year. Larry Herndon's name also... Coming up recently when one of his pupils, Bobby Higginson, hit home runs in four consecutive at-bats during interleague play against the New York Mets, becoming the first Tiger to uh, hit the four consecutive home runs since Larry Herndon. Bobby Higginson with the night off tonight. Boy, is he a good hard-nosed player. Out of the Philadelphia area. Went to Temple University. He is a good-looking player, boy. He really comes to play hard. He's one of those dirty uniform players. The 2-2 two -two pitch. Evan fouls it back. You know, when... There's Bobby Higginson. 
left-handed hitter sitting it out tonight against a tough left-handed pitcher in Wilson Alvarez. If you got to sit a guy and give him a little break, and just remember, this club has come off a very difficult road trip. 11 games in 11 days all over the country, one end of it to the other. Evan bounces it to the second baseman, Durham. One, two, three inning for Alvarez in the fourth. Snapper's great more for 40 deal. Buy any new Snapper ride-on mower and get a utility trailer for under 40 bucks. Buy any new Snapper rear engine rider. He like Frank Thomas. Mike Cameron takes strike one. We already talked about the company he's in. I mean, here's a guy that, as big as he is, is very selective, has power to all fields. Uh, really tough to emulate him. One and one. Kevin Jarvis working his second inning in relief of Justin Thompson. The line on Thompson, three innings pitched, six hits, two runs, both coming on the Thomas Holbert. One walk and three strikeouts. Cameron lifts this one high in the air, and the pitcher Jarvis then called off by the third baseman, Fryman, who makes the catch. Remember, we saw Karkovice pop up to Justin Thompson on the mound back in the second inning, but this time Jarvis was called off by Fryman. Well, an infielder has to call this play here. Now, the pitcher normally is not supposed to be in the middle of this play. He's supposed to be out there helping to call the man that he wants to have catch the ball. So I think at least you can say that Kevin Jarvis is paying attention earlier in the game. He thought he'd do the same thing Justin Thompson did. You and know, here is Frank Thomas, who homered back in the first, flied out with the bases loaded in the second. Pitchers in the American League want to hit. And they also now decide they want to catch pop-ups in the infield. Line drive, oh, knocked down, nearly caught by the second baseman, Eastley. So Thomas is on with his second infield single in as many games. Now, this is a heck of an effort, but this is a rocket. Frank Thomas just laid the wood on this one. This was a rising line drive. I didn't, I didn't think Eastley could get up that high. Look how high off the ground he was. I mean, uh, with that kind of jump, he could have stuffed the basketball. I tell you what, that was a nice attempt, but that ball was hit so hard. A line drive knocked down by Eastley. So Thomas down at first, and here is Albert Bell, who has not hit the ball out of the infield. Two infield ground outs. 1-0. There's a little sign that hitters will give to the umpire. They'll tap the top of their helmet, kind of pat on the top of their helmet. It's for the the umpire in the infield at second base to move out of the vision. And that's exactly what Albert Bell just did. Tapped on his helmet. It's being a little polite and asking Dave Phillips, the umpire at second base, to move over the other side. And Bell crushes his foul. Did it come down in the park? I think that went over the roof, didn't it? We're still looking for it. Yeah, I know, and all the, the fans are still looking like, where'd that go? Now let's see him hit one out of the ballpark in fair turn. Mm -hmm, and he can do it. Not this time, one and two. That was a good sinker. That was a 90 mile an hour sinker from Kevin Jarvis. You can see the bottom fall out of this one. Watch this pitch. Ooh, look at that. 90 mile an hour to throw the ball and it sinks that much. And Albert Bell swung right over the top of it. The one two from Jarvis. Albert Bell. Right out and he is now 0 for 3 and the Tiger fans let him know. This is a good live fastball. This is a 92 mile an hour fastball right in on his hands and it keeps chasing him. Now watch him try to hold. He can't hold up and he knows he's out of there. Well, that's a good live fastball. I didn't realize Jarvis threw this hard. Two outs for Lyle Luton who takes strike one. One for two, struck out his last time up. Thomas down at first base.
Jarvis deals and Mouton fouls it off. So he falls behind 0 and 2. Jarvis retired the side of the fourth, allowed only the infield single. The line shot to second base by Thomas here in the fifth. One and two. Watching Kevin Jarvis work, you can see he is completely opposite what we had seen naturally throwing right-handed to Justin Thomas left-handed, but he uses a two-seam grip instead of a four-seam. He doesn't go across the seams. He puts his fingers along the seams, and that's why he gets that sinker that he throws so hard to dive. And that one dove way outside, two and two. Yeah, that was the slider, but normally pitchers will set the grip. And unless they are split finger pitchers where they set it in that, you'll see now he has, yeah, he's got his fingers along the seams, as you can see behind his back. Pace hit left field for Mouton. Thomas stops at second. So with two away, the White Sox with two men on. Well, that was supposedly a sinker, and that did not sink at all. It stayed right in the middle of the zone. Sometimes if you start a sinker a little too high and you don't get enough pronation as you throw the ball and, and pull it down, it'll stay right in the middle. Watch this. This doesn't do anything. Watch how straight it is. And Lyle Bouton gets ahead of the bat out and hits the line drive base at the left. Harold Beams, one for two, singled his last time up. Lanes with a hit in seven consecutive games. And the pitch from Jarvis. Base hit left field. Here comes Thomas rounding third. The throw from Nevin cut off by Fryman. And the White Sox lead 3-0. That's a good piece of hitting by Harold Baines. As you had mentioned, he has been hot lately. But he, this ball's away from him. He's off the plate, and he goes into the ball. He's not trying to hook it. He drives it the other way. He's willing to take a base hit to left field. Watch how the pitch is out away from him. See how he stays in and goes out with it. Boy, that is a terrific hitting stroke. Look at his head right down his arm. So an RBI for Harold Baines, and with that base hit, Jeff, Baines has just tied, coincidentally, Tigers manager Buddy Bell on the all-time hits list. And Snowpack lifts this one deep to left center. And it's pulled in by Hunter, so that does it for the White Sox in the fifth, but not before they add to their lead. It is now 3-0 Chicago. Here at Tiger Stadium in Detroit, as we take a look at the uh, three soon to be four retired numbers here at Tiger Stadium. Number two is Charlie Gehringer. Number five is Hank Greenberg, the big home run hitter. Al Kaline, number six, won a batting title at 20 years of age and soon to be the one that's over on the right side, July 27th, is Hal Newhouser, known as Prince Hal Newhouser, Hall of Famer. Al Newhauser will have his number 16 retired this Sunday afternoon. Defensive change for the White Sox. Ozzie Guillen has replaced Norberto Martin at shortstop. One and one. Guillen made the league strikeout leader. And that is exactly what he did in his first plate appearance back in the second inning. Two and one. Well, this is an excellent shot to see what kind of pitcher Wilson Alvarez is and what kind of stuff he has. And this is why he's maturing so much. He was a kid who pitched throughout the Venezuelan youth league. Uh, internationally was very successful. Three and one. Now that was after my saying how smooth he's gotten. That was a terrible pitch. He just didn't stay together. You have to stay very slow and stay over the rubber when you're going to throw a breaking ball like that because it takes time to get your arm up and over the top, but he's a very smooth delivery pitcher. And he works the count to three and two. 
you know, I go back to people um, talk about Sandy Koufax, probably the greatest left-hander that ever lived, and I was fortunate enough to be a part of a little bit of his career, having caught his perfect game. Well, he was one of those very slow, easy delivery guys, and the ball just exploded out of his hand. The payoff pitch from Alvarez, and Nieves is down on strikes once again for the second time tonight, and the Major League leading 120th strikeout of the season. Well, if you keep swinging at this pitch up in the zone right here from the letters up, you're, you're never going to hit it because not only is it hard, but it's hard to get on top of. And see how the ball, how Karkovice had to reach for it. That is a fastball that just keeps cutting like a, and it might even be a cutter. He might just, and when you, a cut fastball is one where we talked about grip all night. It's where you pressure the ball with your big finger instead of your index finger. And here's Orlando Miller who struck out back in the second inning. The bottom four in the Tiger batting order. 0 for 4. Four strikeouts. In fact, Alvarez has allowed only the one base hit and one walk. So two base runners through the first four and a third. The only base hit coming with one out in the second. Off the bat of Phil Nevin. White Sox, meanwhile, with three runs on nine base hits. Boy, that's a nice looking line. 82 pitches. He's, he's just as smooth as can be. And he probably can go a long way in this game because it's cooler tonight. It's not real humid and hot here in Detroit. Call strike three. So Miller goes down for the second time tonight. Alvarez reversing those numbers from his last start on Wednesday against the Yankees. He went six to the third. About 10 runs on nine hits. And he'll struck out the first two Tigers here in the fifth as Matt Walbeck steps in. Manager Terry Bevington checking out the lineup card. He's already inserted Ozzie Keen. First of a three game series. Tomorrow night, Brian Moeller and Danny Darwin. And on Wednesday afternoon, James Baldwin for the White Sox. Willie Blair will uh, head to the mound for Buddy Bell. That's Mike Pazik on Terry Bevington's right. Pitching coach for the White Sox. And they have set up a real good game plan tonight for uh, Wilson Alvarez. Lifts it into center for the Tigers' second base hit. A two-out single as Walbeck continues his hot streak now nine of his last 20. Well Wilson Alvarez can't be very happy with this pitch. This is a hanging curveball and the way he's just throwing that ball so easy and loose and blowing it by people to give him a chance on a hanging breaking ball he's probably kicking himself a little bit. So with two outs and Walbeck the runner on first here's Davey Cruz who walked back in the third inning and was stranded. Bounces the first pitch to the third baseman Snowpack. Five innings complete here in Detroit. Three nothing lead for the White Sox. They created electronic trading. Both to the sixth inning. Kevin Jarvis working his third inning of relief for Buddy Bell's crew. Tigers coming off an 11-game road trip. In fact, to put things in perspective, the first of those 11 games came against the New York Yankees in Hideki Arabu's first Major League start. Last night, Arabu already started for the third time, and the Tigers have finally come home. Boy, that's tough, and especially with the kind of flying across the country. It catches up to you after a while. Strike one call on Karkovice, 0 for 2. This is the start of a six-game homestand for Detroit. In fact, they will play 12 of their next 14 here at Tiger Stadium. As Karkovice fouls it off, falls behind, 0 and 2. White Sox, meanwhile, playing game number 12 in a stretch in which uh, they are on the road for 12 out of 14. And they begin a six-game homestand on Thursday. 
Karkovice really has hit well in this ballpark. He's had a couple two home run, home run games here. Bouncer to Cruz at short. One away to six. Karkovice now 0 for 3. Yeah, you know, Ronnie had uh, asked to be traded or released, or so it was said in the papers. I understand that general manager Ron Schuler said he didn't. Ron Karkovice said he did. But Ronnie had um, he had surgery over the winter on both knees. But boy, when he was healthy, he could throw with anybody. They call him the Cobra. And here comes Ozzie Gian stepping up with this beautiful looking helmet he has. He'd throw that helmet down. I hated to pick it up. I couldn't get it off my hands. He got so much pine tar in that thing that it could mow the whole yard here with that. Gian's first plate appearance. Came into the bottom of the fifth. Replaced Norberto Martin. Ground ball to Clark. Backhands it at first, takes it himself. Two away. To the top of the order and second baseman Ray Durham. Durham two for three. Singles in the first and the second inning came around to score the Thomas home run. Frank Thomas with his 23rd of the season, a two-run shot off Justin Thompson back in the first inning. And then an RBI single by Harold Baines in the fifth, extending the White Sox lead to 3-0. White Sox with a season-high 19 hits yesterday in Baltimore. They scored 10 runs, nine hits already tonight. Ray Dorm has a chance to be a real good player before his career is over. He's got great range at second base. He can run. He's struggling a little bit hitting right-handed, but he has not been a leadoff hitter. And when they traded Tony Phillips, he seemed to try too hard. And he bounces out to Eastley. One, two, three inning for Kevin Jarvis. When the weather was cold, but June and July, five and one. Look at his ERA, two, five, six. Hunter squares to bunt, takes strike one. In fact, Alvarez had one five in a row up until his last outing. He's seventh in the American League in earned run average, seventh in opponent's batting average. Hunter squares once again, one and one. You know, Kenny, when you talk about an ace of the staff, a lot of people don't understand what an ace or a number one guy does. He hooks up with everybody else's good pitchers, and there are some guys that just are not comfortable being the one that the rest of the team follows. The White Sox have had trouble finding an ace. Oh, and Hunter lifts this one in the air to left. Bell on the run on the track, and he makes the catch. <laughs> Talking about the big swing and the swing that Brian Hunter has tried to look like he really wants to drive the ball. Well, this is what the ball players would call warning track power. Here's the pitch. Looks like he got it, but he really didn't get it. He pulled his hands in and it hit down on the bat just a little bit and he just didn't wasn't able to drive the ball. See how his hands came in, lost his power, didn't get extension. So it's one away, Damian Eastley, 0 for 2. Eastley back in the first inning. Slide out to Albert Bell on the warning track as well. And we were talking about what an ace of the staff will do. Back to the box. Alvarez, Thomas, two away. And with the White Sox, when Jack McDowell was traded to the Yankees, the White Sox had nobody step up right away. It took a couple years, and finally Alex Fernandez did last year, and then he left as a free agent. Well, Wilson Alvarez has basically the same kind of stuff and the ability to do so. But sometimes it's just a mindset. But you always, when you are the number one pitcher, the ace on the staff, you hook up with everybody else's ace. I mean, you'll in the American League, of course, you'll hook up with Randy Johnson. You'll hook up with David Cohn, people like that. And it makes for, you know, the, the record might not be so great that way. Travis Prime at 0 for 2. And like Alex Fernandez last year, Wilson Alvarez will be a free agent at the conclusion of the 97 season. One and one. And there has been much talk with the attendance problems the White Sox have gone through this season about whether or not they will be able to afford to keep players such as Alvarez. In fact, one big question in Chicago is will the White Sox be able to uh, 
handle the contract of Robin Ventura following this season. So that's diff very difficult. You know, I managed that White Sox club for three years. I loved it there in Chicago. Terry Bevington, as you look at him, was my third base coach. That is a great sports town. The south side of Chicago really supported us. We closed old Comiskey Ballpark, you know, in 1991, 94 games. The fans were really behind us. And the team kept getting better and better. In 93, of course, they played Toronto in the ALCS and lost. 94, when the strike hit, they were a game up on Cleveland in the Central Division. But, you know, the fans were there. They were loving it. But they... Now they're just not coming out in the numbers that everyone thought they would because we drew two million in the old ballpark and three in the new ballpark the following year in 91. Bryman lets this clock to left. Bell on the run. He's got it. One, two, three inning for Wilson Alvarez as Albert Bell cracks that one down. Six complete in Detroit. in the fifth in relief of Justin Thompson working into his fourth inning. Cameron 0 for 2 with a walk. Ball one. Mike Cameron's a good looking young player. He can fly. He stepped up and does a wonderful job in the outfield defensively. Stealing bases. Fouls it off. Behind the Tigers dugout. Bounces back. And a nice catch by the third base coach, Doug Rader, who flips it back into the stands. <laughs> you got to be careful throwing them back in there. If you hit somebody, the level will sue you. Look at Doug Rader. He's a pitbull to begin with. Good player. The rooster, they used to call him in Houston. Cameron fouls it back. One and two. Yeah, I was just thinking about the White Sox. Several years ago, the White Sox really started rebuilding the system. And Terry Bevington managed in the minor leagues, was a very successful AAA manager, came to the big leagues. Al Goldis at the time, who was second in command with the White Sox to Larry Hines. Larry and Al Goldis built the farm system, and they did some job. And the farm system has produced over recent years. When you remember that four first-rounders were there in a hurry, and that was Frank Thomas, Robin Ventura, uh, Alex Fernandez, and I'm missing one. Oh, Jack McDowell was the first one. I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty good selection scouting, and, and that's why the White Sox can start to really play in the early 90s, and they're starting to do it again. They have Mike Cameron, who's really a good-looking prospect. you got a kid down below named Jeff Abbott, another good outfielder. Jarvis. Kevin Jarvis has looked great. Watch this ball. I mean, with a good heat he's got, now you see this breaking ball. Look at this. I mean, that is a, that's a nasty pitch. One out in the seventh. Frank Thomas, two for three. It was back in the first inning. Third batter of the game against Justin Thompson. When Thomas would put the White Sox on the scoreboard, his 23rd home run of the season. And he looked easy, didn't he? Boy, is he a big man and a big, strong man. If he worked hard to stay in shape. One and one. Every year he says he's going to go on. He's going to work out harder the next winter. I don't know how he does it. He is really a mammoth man who works very hard to be as good as he is. Despite missing 13 games in June with the stomach muscle injury, Thomas with 86 RBI. Oh, that's right. And he pulled that muscle in his side, which is really tough, you know, the kind of swing that he takes. You saw just a minute ago, he tried to check swing and he fell in his hands, but he developed such torque if the bat head through so quick. Outside, three and one. Albert Bell 0 for 3, waiting on deck. Thomas fouls it off. Clark in pursuit. 3 and 2. Talking to you before, about the first time I really saw Frank play was in spring training of 1990. 
and I ran him out there in a lineup against Nolan Ryan just doing to see what he could do. All he did was hit a screaming home run over the scoreboard in Port Charlotte, Florida. Came back the next day, hit another one off of Brad Arnsberg, and I was at that point determined to try to sell Larry Himes on the idea that I'll take him right now, but I didn't get him to August, but the rest is in history. Thomas stays alive. Now the we trick should. was, was Larry Himes in attendance when Thomas homered off Nolan Ryan or off Brad Arnsberg? If he saw the shot off Ryan, he saw both of them, but he, he said, I'm not going to rush this kid. And that's what player development people are so good about. You know, they don't want to hurt somebody and push them too fast. But the manager, on the other hand, <laughs> he was selfish. Speaking of the White Sox manager, back in the early 90s, the Chicago White Sox, surprisingly, with the second best record in the majors during this decade. Well, 1990, we broke out with 94 wins. Unfortunately, we were in the same division with the the Oakland A's, who won 103 that year, and in the following year, won 87. And from then on, I don't think ever won less than 86 games. And you know, we're just have been really a power. And you saw the Cleveland Indians number four on that list, thanks largely to this man, Albert Bell, who takes ball one, one away. Frank Thomas, runner on first base. Bell has not hit the ball out of the infield. Two ground outs, and he struck out in his last plate appearance against Kevin Jarvis. And Bell hits this one high in the air. The left fielder, Nevin, on the edge of the grass, edge of the warning track, makes the catch. And Thomas hustles back to first. Two away. Well, tune into FX this weekend for Major Movie Sunday. Major Hollywood movie every Sunday. This week, Tom Selleck is a struggling businessman trying to kill his parents for insurance money in the hilarious comedy Folks. That's Sunday at 8, 7 Central on FX. Two outs to the top of the seventh. As Terry Bevington looks on, his club leading 3 0. Here's Lyle Mouton, two for three. A pair of singles. Sandwiched around the strikeout. Bounces it foul. 3 0 White Sox lead from Tiger Stadium in Detroit. Kenny Albert with Jeff Torborg on Major League Monday here on FX. Two run Frank Thomas home run in the first inning. RBI single by Harold Baines in the fifth. The 0 1 to Mouton, 0 and 2. And the weather certainly cooperated tonight, Jeff. It rained nearly all day here in Detroit. Downpours in both the morning and then later in the afternoon. The rain stopped at about 6.45 local time. And it has been beautiful baseball weather ever since. It really has been. I, I wasn't sure that it was ever going to get this game in, except this field drains so beautifully. I wasn't sure you'd make it here today with the flight problems. Boy, that was my first concern. I thought, oh, this would be the first one that I've never made in 33 years, a major league game I was supposed to be at. But it's a little difficult right now, even though it's cleared up. It's a little difficult to see right now. The lights haven't really taken hold. Did you see the way the ball was played by Phil Nevin before? The ball that Albert Bell hit, Nevin didn't see right away. So the infielders have to really help the outfielders out right now. When the ball goes up, they quick turn and point to where it is. Luton bounces it to the shortstop, Cruz, over to Eastley at second. And that will do it for the White Sox. Seven days press time here in Detroit. Well, the fans certainly entertained during the seventh inning stretch here at Tiger Stadium, despite the uh, three nothing lead for the visiting White Sox. Our game summary: Ray Durham two for four, Frank Thomas two run homer, while Lutz on a pair of base hits as well, and Wilson Alvarez over the first six innings has allowed only three base runners. Boy, he's been magnificent. I've seen him with some good games, as we mentioned about his no hitter the first time out as a White Sox pitcher but he's had some outstanding games over the years and he really looks like he's really in a groove now. Here's Tony Clark 0 for 2. A pair of ground outs. 
Mark, the second overall draft pick back in 1990, behind only Chipper Jones. Basketball star in high school. In fact, he broke Bill Walton's all-time scoring record in San Diego County and went on to play at both Arizona and San Diego State before suffering a back injury which prohibited him from continuing in basketball and then concentrated solely on baseball. It's amazing he's doing this well. He's still so young and doing this well, you know, with a great big swing. Mind you, a little Dave Winfield size. Winfield also a, a star basketball player in high school and college, drafted by the NBA. Drafted by the NFL, never played college football. Drafted by, drafted by uh, two professional basketball leagues, wasn't he? The NBA and the ABA. Yeah, and he was a pitcher in college too, as long as well as an outfielder. The 0-2 and Alvarez strikes out Tony Clark, sixth strikeout for Wilson Alvarez. Well, One away in the seventh. Excuse me, Kenny. This is a nasty breaking ball that Wilson Alvarez throws. It's just tough for any hitter, especially you guys six eight swinging over the top of a breaking ball that's diving like that. Look at this. This isn't fair. Here's Phil Nevin, who has one of the two base hits against Alvarez. Nevin one for two. He singled back in the second inning. You know, watching Ron Karkovic, he hasn't been out there too much, but it doesn't show. He's really done a beautiful job of handling Wilson tonight. 2-0. Alvarez making his 21st start. Eight wins, seven losses. Although he has won five of his last six. Strike one call. Notice how they're in such sync when Karkovic puts the one sign down. He doesn't normally have to give another one. There he goes. They want this fastball inside. Oh, that was certainly inside. <laughs> yes, it was. But it, when a pitcher and catcher get in a relationship where it just moves so well, when the game starts going like this, the tempo is great. Now watch this. Karko set up inside. Well, we always taught our pitchers, if you're going to miss inside, miss farther in. Don't miss over the plate where you get hurt. And obviously, he listens. Brand two. Alvarez looking to duplicate yesterday's performance, a complete game victory for Jamie Navarro, who allowed two Oriole runs in the ninth, and that was it. Gets away from the captured Karkovice, so never strikes out, yet is saved down at first. Well, this was the ball that was in the dirt that Nevin swung at, and it went between Karkovice's legs. One of the problems you have as a catcher, when a guy swings in your vision like this, you're not sure where the ball went. Now, you really want to stay down on it. Karko came up on it, but see how far out that ball hit on the plate. And with Nevin swinging, Karko tried to come up with it instead of blocking it, and it went between his legs. This is a tough play. Fourth wild pitch of the season by Alvarez to go along with strikeout number seven. Here's Melvin Nieves who has been struck out by Alvarez in both of his at-bats tonight. The one away, Nevin the runner out at first base. White Sox leading 3 nothing in the first of this three-game set. Tigers have won four of the first six games played between these two. Taking two of three, both at Comiskey and here at Tiger Stadium. One and one. And this, as we mentioned, the Major League's leading strikeout man at the plate. And by virtue of his striking out 120 times, he is also the second toughest to double up Jeff in the American League. <laughs> You got to hit the ball a double up, right? I two and one. Wilson Alvarez has allowed only two base hits. No Tigers have advanced past second base. 
Brilliant performance tonight by the 27-year-old left-hander. 2-1, the Ennis chased it, 2-2. Two two. Well, that was a nice changeup. Instead of trying to, as we mentioned earlier, instead of trying to reach back and try to throw harder, take something off. But I would think now that the Evans is either going to see another off-speed pitch down in the dirt or a good high-riding fastball again to try to make him swing at it. I don't think he can catch up to Wilson's fastball if he keeps it from the middle end under his hand. You know, they're going with an off-speed pitch. This is not a fastball. Probably a curveball. And Evans has gone down on strikes for the third time tonight. Eight strikeout for Alvarez. Well, watch this setup here. Now, this is an outstanding changeup that Nieves went after. Now, he's shown it to him. Now, watch the out pitch. This is a downer curveball inside. If he does hit the ball, he's liable to hit off his front knee. That ball was a good driving downer curveball. Boy, that was an outstanding setup to get him. Orlando Miller has struck out both times up, 0 for 2. He will, if he can strike Orlando Miller out, he'll tie a record, I guess, that many hold. That would be four strikeouts in an inning. One and one. You know what he just did. Now, you don't see this very often. He threw two change-ups in a row. People say, why, number one, would you throw a changeup on the first pitch to somebody? Because it's not a changeup off of what? He hasn't seen anything in this at bat. But his changeup is so good that he's thrown two in a row now. One for a ball, one for a strike. Devin, the runner down at first. One and two. Now, when you, when you have good stuff, and, and we've been talking about it so much, the pitcher and catcher and the stuff that the pitcher has, the catcher might give a sign in one part of the plate. He wants a fastball low and away, as Karkovic just did, and that ball was on the other half of the plate. But that's because Wilson Alvarez's ball is running so much. It's all over the place. It's, it's like a breaking ball uh, that he's not even sure where it's going to go. Parker wants another fastball inside to Orlando Miller. The one, two, and there it is. Wilson Alvarez ties a major league record by striking out four Tigers in one inning. Coming up after the game, it's the hilarious antics of Jim Carrey and the cast of In Living Color, followed by the quirky antics of the citizens of Rome, Wisconsin, on the award-winning Picket Fences, all coming up after the game on FX, Fox, Gone Cable. We move to the eighth here in Detroit. 3-0 White Sox lead. Harold Baines will lead off the top half of the eighth inning against Kevin Jarvis. As Terry Bevington looks on, his club with the three-run lead. Harold Baines singled in a run in the fifth with his second base hit. And as we mentioned at the time, with that hit, Jeff, he tied Tigers manager Buddy Bell on the all-time hits list, 2,514, 71st all-time. And with a base hit here, could surpass the Tigers manager in the other dugout. Baines two for three tonight. Now batting 341 over his last 24 games as we take a look at his recent hot streak. Baines homered last night against his former club in Baltimore. Two hits tonight. Along with the RBI, and he hits this one deep in the air to right center. Coming over to make the catch is the center fielder, Brian Hunter. Harold Baines is a man of very few words, and he's kind of funny. He was interviewed one, I'm sure he's done this several times, but one time a few years back, and he hit a ball a mile. And after the game was over, a writer said to him, you must have hit that very well. You know, did you get all of it? And he said, evidently, <laughs> that was it. That's all he said. <laughs> but he's a great guy in a ball club, and he's probably in the best shape of his career right now. 
Herm Schneider, the trainer with the White Sox, one of the best I've ever seen at rehabbing uh, injured players. You know, he had Bo Jackson with that bad hip and the hip replacement, and Ozzie Guillen after a, a dramatically injured knee in a collision with Tim Raines. Ivan Calderon's shoulder. Chris Snowpack lifts this one into center field. Hunter once again. Two away in the eighth. And Jeff, as we take a look at our MCI interactive fan email, Ethan Ramsey of Lexington, Massachusetts, asks with the addition of Albert Bell, the White Sox were expected to excel. What has been the problem? Well, they get off to such a slow start uh, offensively. They have not played well defensively. But I really think when I saw Robin Ventura go down in that spring training game in Sarasota, Florida, and badly break his leg and dislocate the ankle, that they were going to be in trouble. I thought because their, their lineup was a little unbalanced right-handed. And also, they lost their gold glove third baseman and one of their leaders in the clubhouse and on the field. And they are pretty close to getting Robin back and we we're talking about the rehab job Herm Snyder has done that is going to be an important key I think he went down in either his first game or second game I believe he had two home runs in a rehab stint when he went down so he is when he when they get him back watch out these guys are uh, they're starting to come as, as a club only four and a half out Karkovice goes down on strikes Evan Jarvis another one two three inning Bottom of the eighth, upcoming. Next week, it's Major League Monday on FX as the Cincinnati Reds take on the Florida Marlins at Pro Player Stadium. That's next Monday at 7, 6 Central, right here on FX. And the newest member of the Florida Marlins, Jeff Torborg, is Veteran Darren Dalton, who was acquired earlier today from the Philadelphia Phillies in exchange for minor league outfielder Billy McMillan. It's a little bit of a surprising trade because you don't know where Darren's going to play. That the Florida Marlins club's a good-looking club already. Matt Walbeck with a slow roller to the third baseman Snowpack, who throws out Walbeck one away here in the eighth. Dalton, 17 years in the Phillies organization. Now a member of the Florida Marlins. I want to tell you something. What a leader. What a guy, a presence on a team. I've watched him from the other dugout when I was managing the Mets. That guy is really a force everywhere he goes. I can see why the Marlins went for him, but I'm just not quite sure their situation or where he's going to play. But it's certainly, you know, he just coming off the bat as a pinch hitter, he'd be a big force. Many baseball insiders felt that Dalton would be headed to an American League club where he could designate a hit and not have to play the field day in and day out. I thought so, too. There'd been a rumor a while back that he was going over to the Orioles. But of course, when Geronimo Barreau went over, of course, that stopped that. But so Dalton to the Marlins. Highly touted outfielder Willie McMillan heads to the Phillies AAA affiliate. Action in the White Sox bullpen. Cruz fouls it off. Matt Karchner, the right-hander. The southpaw's Chuck McElroy. Here's the 0-2 to Cruz. And he stays alive with Brian Hunter on deck. Tigers have had only four base runners tonight. Two singles, a walk. Nevin struck out and advanced on a wild pitch. And Cruz, this one will be for extra bases. Cruz headed for second. Makes the turn, then heads back. First extra base hit of the night for the Tigers. This is a nice piece of hitting. This is a breaking ball down in the strike zone. And 
this is a nice piece of hitting by Davy Cruz. It didn't have a lot of break on it. I don't know if it's maybe instead of a, a good hard slider, it's more of a changeup. It was it was not maybe as hard as they would have liked it. But that was a that was a good act up there by Cruz. He stayed right on that ball. His 17th two base hit this season. The one out Cruz on second for Brian Hunter. Hunter 0 for 3, fly out to Albert Bell on the warning track in the sixth. Now watching the two guys get up in the bullpen, obviously Terry Bevington and Mike Pazic, his pitching coach, uh, have a game plan of what they want to do here, but getting to the eighth inning, and Wilson Alvarez has been in complete com command of this ball game, and maybe they are really worried about the pitch count. It's a nice, cool evening. Side two and oh. And there's Mike on the left. Terry Bevington checking that lineup card. Believe me, the manager in that dugout just lives with that lineup card. Now we just got word that he does have 125 pitches. Now I see why they do have him up in the bullpen. Curve misses three and oh. Well, we've always said, and when watching pitchers in the latter part of the game, when they get tired, they don't lose their stuff as much as they lose their command. Their legs start to go from under them. And right now, Wilson Alvarez is kind of jumping off the mound. He's lost the real smooth delivery he had before. Three and one. Alvarez struck out four Tigers back in the seventh. But he allowed the one-out double to Cruz. Cruz on second. Three and one count to Hunter. Ball four. So for the first time tonight, the Tigers have two base runners. And here comes Terry Bevington. Well, as we were speaking before about Wilson Alvarez, with the number of pitches he had, you can watch this last pitch. He just didn't finish it. He cut it off. Look, see how he stopped? Instead of reaching out, he stopped and spun over, and Terry Bevington has seen enough, so now he's bringing in Karchner. So uh, the manager sits out there, and he's not just looking at that lineup card. He's reading the body language of his pitcher as well, and what an outstanding performance by Wilson Alvarez. So Matt Karchner will be the new White Sox pitcher with one away in the eighth. Runners on first and second, and a tying run at the plate in the person of Damian Eastley. Wilson Alvarez sits down after going seven and a third, allowing only three hits. No runs as of yet, although the two base runners are the responsibility of Alvarez. Tune into baseball Thursday this week on Fox Sports Net, the Seattle Mariners, and the Cleveland Indians. Tune in, and you could win a trip. The next week's baseball Thursday game in Milwaukee, courtesy of MCI. Is this a great time or what? Bobby Higginson will pinch hit for Damian Eastley. Higginson with 15 home runs on the season, including three in one game against the New York Mets. Runners on first and second, one away. The matchup is Karchner and Higginson. Strike one call. Well, Matt Karchner, numbers don't look too bad. When you look at an earned run average, it's 2.79. Okay, that's not bad. Fewer hits, 28 than innings pitch, 29, but more walks and strikeouts. Higginson floats it to center. Coming out is Cameron, could not get to it. And holding up at third is Cruz, so the bases are loaded. Now this is a pretty good bit of coaching by the third base coach Perry Hill. Third base coaches when a runner comes around third end up halfway down toward home plate trying to hold him up. He couldn't take a chance of having someone thrown out at the plate there when they're three runs down even though it didn't look like Mike Cameron was going to make a throw. But Perry Hill came way up the line and made sure he stopped Davy Cruz. Bases loaded. Cruz on third. 
Hunter, the runner on second. Higginson on first. Travis Bryman, 0 for 3. He's flied out all three times up. Ball one. Well, Parcher's a big guy, 6'4", 210, and he comes a little bit low with an arm angle, and he just tried to throw a breaking ball to Travis Priman to start him off, and he missed with it. So if he misses again, if they throw him another one, Priman likes the hard stuff. But he made a good pitch on the outside part of the plate to even account at one and one, but Wilson Alvarez sitting in the dugout still complaining. He's mad at himself for what he did there. I think he probably didn't. He's second-guessing his call to Davy Cruz on a breaking ball. Well, Fryman was the hero against the White Sox back in April. A three-run homer in the ninth inning off Roberto Hernandez. And he falls behind here. One ball, two strikes. Well, the White Sox saw what we were talking about earlier, too, with the open stance from Travis Fryman and bringing his left foot back toward the plate. He makes him vulnerable, the ball inside. And they just ran a ball right on his thumbs that he just couldn't get the head of the bat out on. So I would think now one and two, if you're trying to guess along with Ron Parkovice, it's he probably will go with a slider low and away here. Either that or if that will way back in. But I think they'll try to make him chase it. No, they're going back inside. And Freiman stays alive. One and two with Tony Clark waiting on deck. Wilson Alvarez with the three-nothing lead. But the bases are loaded. There's Clark. One ball, two strikes to count on Travis Freiman. Well, it's a good looking numbers there with the bases loaded for Travis Freiman. The shortstop key in to Durham to Kevin double play. So Freiman rounds into a 6 4 3 double play. Kutchner works out of the jam, and the happiest man in the house is Wilson Alvarez. Well, Matt Karchner worked out of the jam, so Wilson Alvarez in seven and a third did not allow a run. White Sox hanging on to their three-nothing lead. This copyrighted telecast is presented by the authority of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or transmitted in any form without express written consent. Ozzie Guillen will lead it off for the White Sox. Jody Reed has come on at second base. Higginson pinch hit for Eastley, so Jody Reed. Now the second baseman as Gian takes strike one. Gian bounced out to the first baseman Clark in his only plate appearance after replacing Norberto Martin. Kevin Jarvis working in his sixth inning of relief. Justin Thompson, the starter, coming off the 15-day DL. Pitched three innings as Gian lines one up the middle with the leadoff single here in the ninth. Thompson allowing the six hits, two runs, and he threw a lot of pitches over the first three. So Kevin Jarvis came in, and aside from the fifth inning when he allowed a run on three base hits, has been solid. So with Gian on first. Ray Durham, two for four tonight. Looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth with the Tigers trailing. They will send Clark, Nevin, and the Nevis to the plate. Tremendous opportunity for Buddy Bell's squad in the eighth with the bases loaded and only one away. Bryman grounded into the 6-4-3 double play. Again, the throw. And those two throws over were really to get a read to see if the White Sox are going to try to do something here because they tend to like to run with Ozzy backed up when the hit and run situation where he's protected by a hitter. And with five steals out of the season, Durham takes strike one. Now, Ozzy used to be able to steal bases, but after he had that uh, terrible collision with Tim Raines and had his knee completely reconstructed, he doesn't run as much. But you can take a look at him at first base. When he takes the lead off, you can see the antsiness. If he gets his right foot open, the lead foot open a lot, he might be thinking about running. Jarvis checks the runner again at first. And the 
pitch to Durham is a call strike two. Now, I was talking about the right foot of the base runner. When you see a good base runner gets out and he takes his right foot and opens it towards second base, that allows him to use a crossover step, which is the quickest way to get to second base. So as a catcher, you would look down here to try to see if the runner is showing anything that might indicate he might be running. And sometimes the right foot gives him away. Ryan Titan, one and two. Now, it's also tough on a catcher. When you have a base runner down there and you think it might be a running situation and, and you have a hitter, a left-handed hitter, is way back in the box, he sometimes blocks you out. You cannot see the base runner. That's why you see a catcher come flying out from behind a left-hander a lot. Two balls, two strikes. By the same token, I used to really like to pick guys off at first base. Left-handed hitter up. Signal that you want the ball inside. Go inside, come right out from behind the hitter. He doesn't see you coming behind the hitter, and you throw to first base. Good pickoff. Way of doing it. Oh, nice play at second by Reed. And he throws out Durham. So Jody Reed, who came on here in the ninth after Bobby Higginson pitch hit for Damian Eastley. Deep in the hole at second. One away. Boy, how about this? Coming off the bench, not having played all the game, and going in here and make a play like this. This is a great play. Jody Reed's been a good player for a long time. You know, it's one thing to dive for ball and, and they be able to catch. It's another thing to get up and be able to make a good throw. So Jody Reed getting the uniform dirty. Mike Cameron 0 for 3 with a walk. Mike one call. Gee and the runner down at second base. White Sox 3. And the Tigers nothing. White Sox scoring in the first inning for their third consecutive game. Frank Thomas the two run shot in the first. As Cameron fouls it back 0 and 2. Now Beans adding an insurance run in the fifth. An RBI single, the only real threat by the Tigers came in the last of the eight. And they loaded the bases, they chased Wilson Alvarez, but Matt Parchner got Travis Freiman to ground into the double play. The 0-2 to Cameron, and he loops it into left. On the run is Devin. Two outs, zero to nine. Cameron heads back to the dugout. 0 for 4, so his eight-game hitting streak will in all likelihood come to an end. And here is Frank Thomas, who has reached base in three of his four plate appearances, came in with the best on-base percentage in the American League at 472. Two-run homer in the first, wide out with the bases loaded in the second, singled and scored in the fifth, walked in the seventh. Frank was the first man to say that he wanted, really wanted Albert Bell on this ball club. And one of the reasons was he wanted somebody behind him so they couldn't pitch around him. Now you have a situation that you have an open base. And in last year, if, if this situation were to arise, they would very often either intentionally walk him or pitch around him, meaning they wouldn't give him anything to hit. Well, now with Albert Bell behind him, uh, Frank can go up there and whack him. You know, he's looking for that pitch and he knows he doesn't have to chase bad balls in order to try to drive a run in for his team. And Rick Adair, the pitching coach, ran out to talk to Kevin Jarvis along with Matt Walbeck, the catcher. And what they're saying is the same thing we're talking about up here. There is an open base, even though Bell is on deck. There is an open base, so you do not have to groove a pitch here. Thomas, six for eight over the last two games. Four for five, four RBI yesterday in Baltimore. Two more runs batted in tonight. Two runs scored. His 23rd home run. 2 and 0. Those are two pretty good pitches. He just missed with him. He was trying to nibble on the outside part of the plate, and make Frank chase the ball. Out off the plate, and maybe just either hit a ground ball to the right side or a fly ball to right field. Falls behind 3 0. 
You know, one of the things I always guarded against as a manager was going out to the pitcher and saying, uh, well, don't walk this guy, but don't give him anything to hit. Now, that's, that's tough ingredient, you know, so you either say, okay, go after him hard, go off the plate, tell him where you wanted the ball thrown. And there is ball four, so Thomas walks for the second time tonight. And you hear the... Uh, the reaction from the crowd as Albert Bell steps to the plate. Bell 0 for 4. A pair of ground outs. Struck out in the fifth. Fly to left in the seventh. Runners on first and second. Guillen down at second. Thomas the runner on first. Thomas on base for the fourth time tonight in five plate appearances. 3-0 White Sox, two outs, top of the ninth. And the pitch to Bell is high for ball one. Well, now it starts to get dangerous because you're putting in Albert Bell, who really can focus in and lock in on a, on a zone where he wants to swing the bat, what he wants to go after. Now you're giving him, you're putting him in a hitter's count with the bases loaded. you got no place to, really, you don't really want to, I shouldn't say with the bases loaded, but with runners at first and second, and they get away with one. Yes, they do, as Bell lifts it in the air to right the Ellis. Albert Bell 0 for 5 as we move to the bottom of the ninth. Clark, Nevin, and the Evans. First of the three games set in Detroit. Eight and a half complete. White Sox leading at 3 0. And Roberto Hernandez will come on and try and finish things off for the White Sox. And you look at those numbers with Roberto, big guy, 6'4", over 230 pounds. But what you see is strikeouts, 40 strikeouts in 43 innings. Maybe a little too many walks, 23, but 38 hits in 43 innings. That's a nice ratio. This guy, we've talked about pitchers having good stuff all night. We talked about Justin Thompson. We talked about Wilson Alvarez. This guy has the best stuff of anybody coming into this game. He's got a 95 to 97, 98 mile an hour fastball. He can make the ball sink, hard breaking stuff. And what a story. One year I, I asked to have him brought up as a long reliever and to find out that not only does he have an aneurysm in his arm, but I mean his life is maybe in danger. And they operate on him. Three months later, he made it to the big leagues. A heck of a story. Strike one call, Tony Clark, 0 for 3. It's been a quiet night for both Albert Bell and Tony Clark. Bell 0 for 5, but uh, Frank Thomas coming up large with the first inning home run. We talked about the pitching matchup in the open. And Wilson Alvarez watching as Roberto Hernandez looks to close out win number 9 for Wilson Alvarez. Alvarez's heart must have been up in his throat during the eighth inning Ooh. with the bases loaded. Not only are the bases loaded, the tying run on first, but they had Travis Fryman and then Tony Clark waiting on deck. The one-two, and Hernandez sends Clark to the dugout. Clark strikes out for the second time tonight, one away. Uh, Roberto Hernandez, I mentioned, has this great fastball, but he also has a great split finger. Now watch this. Watch that ball dive. Now you here you are looking at a guy who can really blow the ball by up in the strike zone. So see that funny rotation on the ball? That's what a split finger does. It cho you choke off the rotation of the ball. That's why it sinks. So he sets it up with a fastball like he just came in with a fastball. To Phil Nevin. And now let's see where he goes. The audio folks here at Tiger Stadium having some fun as Phil Nevin stepped up to the plate. Flaring out of the public address system, one of the Olympic theme songs. Bill Nevin, of course, a, a U.S. Olympian back mm -hmm. in 92. One and two. This is not the count you want to get in with a guy who has an exceptional split finger and has a good live fastball from the strike zone. Because you have to protect up hard. In other words, you got to have it geared up. Because when you get... A count, we have two strikes on you. Now is when the split finger, if it's down in the strike zone, just can make you look silly. Oh. 
Nevin stays alive. Well, there it was, and he was able to foul it off. Phil Nevin was the number one pick of the Astros. Uh, out of Cal State Fullerton, was an All-American, was the star of the College World Series. And it took him a while. He bounced around. He'd come up with the Houston Astros and not cut it and go back down. He was willing to try anything. He even tried to be a catcher last year with Detroit. Went down to double A to try and perfect his catching skills. Mm -hmm. And he's played five different positions this year, including DH. In left field tonight. His aggressive swing, and he's willing to try to play anywhere. And that's the guy that wants to play in the big league. And he bounces this one to third, and it gets by Stolpeck. And Nevin is on it first. We talked about the fielding problems earlier. Stolpeck came in with 14 errors. That is number 15. And that gives the Tigers some life with Melvin Nieves at the plate and the tying run on deck. Well, Terry Bevington just signaled when you saw him cross his arms. He was telling Frank Thomas to play behind Phil Nevin at first base. Don't hold him on there. Because as you just mentioned it, Nieves is not the tying run. And so you're just giving up that first. You're not worrying about that runner at first. Boy, it's been a wacky night. If you're Phil Nevin, he has reached base three times. A conventional single in the second inning. Back in the seventh, he struck out. And headed down to first on the wild pitch and now reaches on the ninth inning error by Snowpeck. There you see the numbers. White Sox perfect when leading through eight. And the Evis falls behind. No balls, two strikes. A night to forget for Melvin the Evis. There you see it. Three strikeouts adding to his league leading total now at 121. And he's 0 2 again. Now he's just got to protect the area here. Earlier this year, Roberto Hernandez got lit up here in this ballpark, came in with a lead like this, and the Tigers were able to whack him around. And, and he was able to actually end up with a win in the game, but he had given up the lead. But, you know, you get in a ballpark like this park in Fenway, and if you're a manager and, and pitching coach and coaching tip, you never take anything for granted. The last out is always a tough one to get, but this ballpark is short in left field and right field and a mistake and you're quickly back a team that's down is quickly back in a ball game. Travis Fryman hit a, a three run ninth inning home run off Hernandez mm -hmm. in that game and Hernandez wound up picking up the victory in 12. Oh just this is one ball two strikes three nothing White Sox bottom of the ninth. Devin the runner on first reached on the error by Snowpack. Inch hitter waiting on deck, Curtis Prime. Now wow. down the right field line. You know, this is a classic example. When you look at a switch hitter, normally from the right side of the plate, they're high ball hitters. From the left side of the plate, they like the ball down. Very true with Melvin Nieves. He's able to fight off the ball down. Now, of course, he struck out on when he was hitting right-handed on balls hard up a little too high out of the strike zone. He's vulnerable up on this side of the plate as well. And a slow roller to the second. Oh, bubble! Safe at first! Durham could not make the play. Potential double play grounder. Two errors here at the bottom of the ninth. Holy mackerel. We talked about it in our open about the problems that the White Sox have defensively. This is an easy play. You know what happened? He wanted to make it so fast. He was going to try to make the feed over to Ozzie Gein at second. And he looked away from the ball a little too early. And this is what's been playing. And see how he pulled his head up and the, he lifted his glove up just a little bit. And another error. We mentioned it earlier, the problems in the field. Snowpack committing his 15th error just moments ago. And now Durham commits his 13th error. Now, Curtis Pride was in the on-deck circle. He is called back to the dugout. And 1994 Rookie of the Year, Bob Hamlin, will be the pinch hitter. And he represents the tying run. Well, the White Sox have seen it happen before. But the reason that there's a discussion going on in the mound or just finished with Mike Pazic, the pitching coach, was 
just to settle Roberto Hernandez down. When you give another club extra outs, and they've given them two extra outs right now, you're just telling your pitcher, hey, it's not your fault. You're throwing the ball well. Continue to do what you've been doing, and they also might be giving a scouting report on Hamlin. But Roberto Hernandez has excellent stuff. If he keeps the ball down and away from Hamlin, what they're trying to do is either get a ground ball or strike out here. Three for five as a pinch hitter. Outside for a ball. So the Tigers loaded the bases in the eighth after Wilson Alvarez was pulled. And after Hernandez struck out Clark, the leadoff man here in the ninth, a pair of errors. First the third baseman Snowpeck, then Durham down at second. And the Tigers have runners on first and second. One out, bottom of the ninth. Never the runner on second. The MS on first. As Hamlin took a good cut at that one. Two and one. Kenny just missed his pitch. That's what the left-hander wants. That ball down in the middle of the plate. And he just missed it because Roberto Hernandez threw it right by him. Watch where this is. This is almost on a tee for Hamlin. And he just couldn't catch up. Pops it foul. Back behind third base. Two and two. Those last two fastballs beat him now. The thing that you think about as a catcher now, do I call an off-speed pitch when I've just thrown two or had two fastballs make the hitter look very slow? Do I take a chance of speeding up his bat by throwing an off-speed pitch here? And Wilson Alvarez was working on that gum before, and he had his head down. He just they, The White Sox have seen some crazy things happen in this ballpark. I think he's sweating more in the eighth and the ninth than in the first over the first seven innings. As Hernandez strikes out Hamlin. Well, they challenged him with hard stuff. They didn't mess around with anything off speed, and that was really obviously a good call. The ball was just thrown right by him. Here's the pitch on the outer part of the plate. Karkovic staying away from his power. And Bob Hamlin is trying to get to catch up, but he just couldn't. Those balls were by him. So with two outs, the pinch hitter for Matt Walbeck will be Curtis Pride. Right, only three for his last 24. He represents the tying run with two away, bottom of the ninth. Tigers down to their last out, trailing 3-0. Runners on first and second. Strike one call. Hernandez looking for save number 25. Did you see what that registered at, Kenny? 98 miles an hour. My Lord, that, I told you he had good stuff, but... I didn't realize it was that high up in that strike zone with that miles per hour. Strike two call, the breaking ball, only 86 miles per hour, same <laughs> result. <laughs> only 86. There are a lot of major league pitchers who'd love to have their best fastball touch 86. Tigers now down to their last strike. There it is. Strike three call by the home plate umpire, Derwood Merrill. And Wilson Alvarez will go out and shake the hand of Roberto Hernandez, who picks up save number 25 after ninth inning errors committed by Chris Snowpeck and Ray Durham. The 